Hello everyone, this is John Crafthouse again. Today I wanted to practice an exercise in painting clouds in watercolor. And so I'm going to be doing a small piece on 9x12 Arteza Pro watercolor paper, which is 100% cotton and 140 pound weight. And I will be using the Arteza Solid Half Pans, which comes in a set of 36, a pencil, two different types of Winsor & Newton sable brushes, and gold leaf that I purchased from Wish. This ended up being a bit of a fail because the gold leaf was artificial and flammable and did not behave as normal gold leaf would. So you'll see towards the end that this almost ruined my piece. However, this is just a study for a possible larger piece that I want to do featuring Horace and uh, Stormy Sky. The images that I'll be using for reference are an image of a sculpture from ancient Egypt of the god Horus, who is usually shown as a falcon in hieroglyphics or as a humanoid with a falcon head. And the other photo that I'll be using for the environment of the piece is a photo I took here in Virginia of a storm that ripped through uh, Manassas the other week and it happened at sunset and it was really violent and really scary but it only lasted for about five minutes it was the strangest cloud formations i had seen so i ran outside when i was walking my dog and i grabbed as many photos as i could i flipped the image backwards and i will be using that in this piece for the environment when I started to make this video with my time-lapse edits, I started researching more on Horus and Horus's creation story, and it's rather interesting. So from Geb, the sky god, and Newt, the earth goddess, uh, there were four children, and it was Nephthys, Set, Isis, and Osiris. Osiris was the oldest son. And so he was deemed the king of Egypt, and he married his sister, Isis. He was considered to be a good king and a great commander, and um, any gods that lived in the netherworld loved him. Uh, but the problem was, was that his younger brother, Set, was extremely jealous of Osiris's position. And the fact that Osiris led his people with love was also something that Set had disdain for. Set decided to exact revenge by converting himself into a monster and attacking Osiris. When he did, he killed Osiris. He then dismembered Osiris's body and put the pieces all over Egypt. Set then ascended to the throne and became the king of Egypt, and his sister Nephthys was his wife. Nephthys and Isis were very good friends as well as sisters, and she showed a lot of compassion for Isis, who was in mourning and was truly distraught over the loss of her husband. So Isis got this idea that if they found the pieces of Osiris's body, she could use her magic and bring him back together for a short period of time. In that time, she would then consummate with him and have a baby. And that baby could claim their ascension to the throne. So Nephthys helped her scour Egypt and find all the pieces of Osiris's body and then they resurrected him. Osiris came back, him and Isis made love and celebrated, and then he, because he was loved so much, was given a position to go down into the netherworld and be the king down there. Isis then has a son, and the son is named Horus, or the hawk god. When he became an adult, he made a case before the court of the gods that he was actually the rightful king of Egypt and not Set. Set had ascended to the throne 
with fraud. This was a huge case to put against someone, especially a king. Set then challenged Horus to a contest with the intention of cheating the entire thing. But this didn't work out to Set's favor. They go, this story begins to have multiple versions at this point. But one thing that becomes very clear in the multiple tellings of it is that the last and final challenge was that Set declared they would have a boat race to decide who was king. But the boat had to be made of stone, which as we all know, stone does not float. So that doesn't make any sense. So Set, displaying his power over the elements, cut the top of a mountain off and put that in the water and was going to use that as a boat. Horus, on the other hand, concocted an idea where he made a boat out of wood and then they applied a faux stone finish to it to make it seem like it was made of stone. And so, of course, he won. This infuriated Set, and Set attacked and tried to kill Horus for a very long time. And eventually, the gods, other gods, stepped in and said it was a tie. And the reason that they stepped in was that Horus was going to eventually kill Set. But through this whole story, what's interesting to notice is Horus has this demeanor of being very calm and emotionally intelligent. And the people, the worshippers, and the other gods, be it in the upper realm or the under realm, really respond to that, just as they did his father. Whereas Set is seen as someone who temper tantrums, leads with fear, and doesn't actually have a lot of respect from others. They just fear him. Once the gods decided this was a tie, they were sympathetic to Horus. And although they clearly saw that he had won and he had bested Set, there was a moment in some tellings of the story where he had shown a lot of anger and uh, resentment towards his mother, Isis. So they went back to court and they decided to call on Osiris. Osiris came up to the court and said, even just in the law of murdering, Set should not rightfully take the seat in the throne because he acquired it by murdering his brother. Osiris proclaimed that the heavens, the sun, the moon, and the stars were on Horus's side. And with that, he left and went back into the underworld, leaving Egypt in a long felled darkness. The gods declared Horus as the king and the darkness lifted and things were better. There are other recounts of this story which say that Egypt was divided and Horus was given the fertile Nile Delta and the Nile River running south in Egypt, all on the eastern side, to reign, and Set was given the desert. And it's told that they warred for a very long time after that. What's also interesting is that the Eye of Horus is very similar to that of the Eye of Ra, which is the eye with the long vertical down from the center, but it's flipped in reverse from the Eye of Ra. Horus was still associated with the daytime, and Set was the god of night. So this all kind of makes sense with the path of the sun. Whereas the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, it is told that Ra took the sun across the sky in the help with the other gods, but when it came to nightfall, there was a large serpent that 
hypnotized all the gods and the only god that was not affected by this was Set. So Set drove his spear into the snake every night so that the sun could continue westing. So you have Horus on the east side, living it up, great weather, rainfall, fertile lands, and you have Seth on the west side, living in squalor, the desert, nothing can grow, there's not a lot of animals, so I can see where this resentment would grow. Throughout the dynasties that we studied in the history of the ancient Egyptians, the roles of these gods actually change, and there is a large part of time during ancient Egyptian civilization where pharaohs were named flowers of Horus because he was a god who took on a semi role like Ra in being an all-encompassing god and because of his virtue he was heavily contrasted against Set who became the embodiment of what people thought was pure evil. So it's interesting to see that Egyptian culture of the ancients really embraced the more peaceful and more prosperous times as opposed to the militant times and uh, even in ideals of winning wars and conquering other lands. What's also interesting about this is that the progress of the sun was also related to life cycles for human beings and it is not recorded that there's any word or verbiage for the word death in ancient Egyptian the phrase is only westing the word set in the English language is a verb and it means to put lay or stand something in a specified place or position, which is interesting because that definition very much relates to Set's role in taking the sun around the other side of the earth from Egypt. Now, the word says that its origins are from the Germanic tribes, but I would reckon that this word goes much further back and has to do with Egyptian lore. So let's go ahead and jump into talking about this painting because I am 13 minutes into this and probably about 45 minutes into the painting in real time. But I wanted to paint Horus as a statue. I'm not sure where I got the photograph idea from. I didn't want to paint Horus into the landscape, but I did really want to paint these clouds and I wanted to make the exercise something more fun than just painting clouds. I don't really think that has a narrative, nor is it part of my personal style. Um, but this kind of collage or mixed media type style, which it becomes later on, is definitely something that I, I've held to since I was much younger. Uh, right now I'm trying to add the rain off in the distance and the way that I build color in watercolor is obviously from light to dark which is standard um, but I'm also using a negative technique and using the paper towel to lightly dab areas of darker watercolor to remove it that then exposes the lighter watercolor underneath now what you can see in the top left corner is that there are these small gray dots, which are actually the exact size of my fingertip. Now what happened there was I pressed too hard with the paper towel. So what happened was, was the paper towel around where I was pressing hard picked up the watercolor pigment, but where I was pressing too hard, it actually pressed the pigment down into the paper, making it permanent. And there is no way for me to remove that. Here you can see the stage the photo was at as I let it dry. I wanted to go ahead and bring some high contrast down into technically what is the background, but this would be the layer of trees off in the distance. Now, even though this will all read as black, 
there are multiple stages of this background. So as you can see, I put two tree trunks and began to paint a tree which is much taller than the rest. And that's so you can get a sense of depth that the trees that are much lower are way further in the background, far away from the viewer, as opposed to the tree that you can see more details on. I also painted the dark black a little bit lower than the lighter gray behind it. And again, that gives an atmospheric perspective in showing you that, oh, well, these black trees are a little bit in front of those lighter gray trees. And with scale perspective, these larger trees are clearly much further forward than the black trees in the background. So I tried to create as much depth as possible while still using this limited color palette. And I think it actually turned out rather successful. A couple of times in this video, you'll see that I go ahead and paint the next darker layer in some of the gray values and blue values before the previous layer is dry. What that does is it allows for a little bit of diffusion of the edges. And in areas like where the rain, the downpour is happening off in the distance, I don't want that to look exactly like rain. I want it to look like movement. So sometimes I allow the paint to bleed and then sometimes I don't want that at all. So I will allow the entire piece to dry, which I've already done once or twice at this point. So now we're getting into the mixed media aspect of this. And I'm layering red in a uh, god-like halo around Horus's head. Why I'm layering red is because in the olden days, in the frescoes and the old religious icon paintings, they laid down a red clay before they gold leafed. Now, preface. I purchased a gold leaf material off of Wish that said 100% real gold leaf. What I didn't realize was that the definition, if you worded it correctly, was 100% real leaf. But it most absolutely was not gold and it was very flammable and it did not behave like gold leaf does. So this is going to be a big mess up. And I'll also be showing you how I tried to repair the edges of this gold leafing. But here I'm applying a glue and I'm smoothing it out as smooth as I can uh, with just a synthetic brush uh, that's just slightly damp. And I want the glue to dry to the point where it no longer glistens. It's a little bit tacky, but it doesn't glisten. And what I'll be doing from there is I'll be laying down the gold leafing with a brush. Now, this isn't going to work out like I thought, but that's the general idea of how you would do this. <clears throat> so as you can see, I'm laying down the leaf, I'm tiling it and brushing it down with a bristle brush, which is a bit stiffer. As you can see, it's not adhering at all. And the reason for that is this is an even leaf. This is foil. <laughs> so it requires a lot harder adhesive and it shredded and went everywhere, which this is not the behavior of 100% gold leafing. So I tried with a natural brush to improve the texture, but nothing worked. So you'll see, I'm going to go ahead and grab an oil-based enamel and go over the foil in a much warmer gold tone, uh, which did help a lot and it gave it a little bit of an antique look, which I enjoyed. But this is me using a wet brush to try and weight the foil down to the glue. Uh, but overall, this just did not help the piece and it did not work effectively at all. So I'm going ahead with the Martha Stewart gold enamel and this is uh, oil base so you will need mineral spirits or paint thinner to get it off of your brush but this really warmed up the foil. I actually enjoy the texture of the foil coming through 
but did not enjoy the color nor the aesthetic that that fake gold foil created. So good thing this is a small study, but if this were a larger piece and it was a final piece, I would scrap it and start over. Sometimes I realize it's easier to put this piece away and start on a new one and save myself the trouble and the struggle of fixing a problem. Sometimes you end up spending hours more fixing something than you would have spent just recreating the piece. And remember, anytime you start over on a piece, it's gonna be better. And you can always go back if it's not. You're just giving yourself more options and more opportunities to create more success. And I actually think it's a good exercise to do pieces multiple times. I don't necessarily sketch a lot in thumbnails. I do think it's a very fast and effective way, especially when you think of things like storyboarding or if you want to map out a series of pieces that you're doing. But I think the 9 by 12 dimension is a great quick way of mapping out a piece. I can change how I want to enlarge this. I can change the proportion of it, which I absolutely would knock some of the top off of this. And I can change a lot of the ideas without feeling like I've wasted so much time creating something that I'm not in love with. I think what was cool about this study piece was one, I was practicing painting clouds and I didn't necessarily execute them perfectly by any means. But two, I got to learn a little bit about what I was painting. It's very easy to just pick an icon and throw them into artwork like many brands and artists do now that just kind of explores the world of maybe our capitalist society or uh, consumerism, but to buckle down and read about historical reference and things of that nature that correlate to what you're painting. In this case, after I finished my painting and I started to read about Horus, weirdly enough, the rest of the painting fell into part of the narrative. And that's the cool thing about this, is that Yes, I could do a study painting clouds. I could paint them perfectly, they could be beautiful. I could do 10 paintings like this of just beautiful clouds and landscapes. But because I threw this icon in it, I gave a narrative. I put a humanoid figure in it. It has an emotional response. It brings up an emotional response from the viewer. And again, you have this landscape in the background where I'm trying to work on my technicality as a watercolor artist. Even though I tend to lean in the more impressionistic route of things, this is definitely something where I really appreciate the mixed aspect of this. What you'll see here now is reasonably I discovered that, well, clouds are not gray and white. There's always a tint or a hue to them. And most likely you're seeing, even in white clouds, a really pale shade of yellow. But because nightfall was coming, uh, this had more of a purple tint. So I went back and started adding a light purple wash in the white areas and a darker purple wash into the dark gray tones. And it automatically brought the clouds uh, more familiar to the sky tones and it made it more cohesive. So it seems more natural even though again they're very impressionist and gestural.
So this is pretty much it. This is the final piece. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of a close up. I went ahead and used white gouache, which is opaque, to paint around the edges of the gold foil circle and the edges of the drawn photograph because I wanted a crisp white there. Um, I then tried to add watercolor on top of that, but it didn't really hold. So I just left it as it was and I think it turned out okay. You can see some textural issues and definitely I would press this and varnish it before I were to put it into my portfolio. But overall, as an exercise for painting clouds, I think it worked out pretty well and it would pique a mysterious aspect when people saw it. So thank you guys so much for watching. Um, I'll be doing more videos like this soon. Uh, but you can sound off below and let me know what you want to see or what you need instruction on.